Hello, everyone, and welcome to the HUD OCIO Learning Session. I'm Dr. Melanie Cohen. Today, we have a very exciting session planned for you. We'll be discussing creativity. Our guest today is Dr. David Burkus from Oral Roberts University. He'll be coming to us from his office in Tulsa. Hi, David. Hi. So let me tell you just a little bit about David. Uh, David Burkus is the author of a best-selling book, The Myths of Creativity, The Truth About How Innovative, Innovative Companies and People generate great ideas. He's also the founder of L, uh, LDRLB and an assistant professor of management at Oral Roberts University. Uh, his work has been featured in Forbes, Fast Company, Psychology Today, Bloomberg Business Week, and the Harvard Business Review. So David, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, well, well thank you so much. It's really kind of cool to be here, even, even virtually. And uh, right now where I am is pouring rain for several days, so I'm thinking about how warm it must be in D.C. and uh, looking jealously at it. Yeah, very warm here in D.C. <laughs> so um, let, me, let me start and sort of set the tone, and then we'll go through a couple of the different myths that I feel like most uh, organizations sort of face, and we'll, we'll break at each one for questions. For, for starters, I, I have to say I'm probably the wrong person to be this sort of creativity guy. <laughs> I actually started out trying to write a leadership book. Um, you know, Melly and I met at the Academy of Management. I study leadership and management, and I got fascinated with this question of what do the leaders of these outstandingly creative companies, your Googles, your Pixars, those type of companies, what do they do differently than leaders of kind of normal companies? And when I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to see what did they do differently from the beginning, meaning when they were just the small sort of myth of the, the garage entrepreneurial startup, what did they do differently that got them to that place, whereas other companies kind of became that the bureaucracy that we all sort of say kills creativity. And, you know, what I, what I found got me really nervous, that you know as a, as a researcher, Melanie, what I found was nothing. <laughs> and when you, get, when you find right. that, you get really nervous. Right. So I started to look back into uh, a lot of the, the quant qualitative research, and I started to find a really interesting characteristic, which was that the companies that were the most innovative and the people that were the most innovative talked about creativity differently than a lot of other people. They use sort of different stories. I like to say, and you can kind of see it on the next um, slide, I like to say that people talk about creativity like it's a religion a lot of, a lot of the time. Like it's, and, and, that, and that kind of makes sense. I like to joke that sometimes people who call themselves creatives kind of act like uh, priests of some far esoteric religion. They're tattooed, they've got piercings everywhere, they call themselves a creative, even though they're really sort of a barista. As we, as we would just call them. And, um, but what I found is interesting about this, because when you, when you, the stories that you tell yourself are true even when they're not true. The stories that you tell yourself become true because of things like confirmation bias. The more you tell yourself that creativity is limited to a set group of people, the, the priest of the esoteric religion of creativity, if you will, then you're, you're either disqualifying yourself or disqualifying other people. And in, in both cases, this is really harmful. So what I wanted to do is dig into where does, first of all, where does creativity come from and then what are the stories that are holding people back? And that's really what set the tone for the book, the myths of creativity. Myths are stories that we tell ourselves that try and explain our world around us. And most of the time when we tell ourselves what become myths, we do it because we don't have access to all of the information. Right. You think back to all of the myths that you learned in school and they're usually written by a society that didn't have all of the, the information to actually explain where did we come from, why are we here, all of those sort of things. We write myths. And creativity is no different. The, the only difference is we now know. We've been studying it for five-plus decades in an academic setting. We, we know a lot of things, and what we found doesn't really jive with the stories. And so not only are these stories an attempt to explain how it happens, but they're in that attempt to explain a lot of people are falling short of their creative potential because they're telling themselves the story that's not even really true. So um, let, me, let me answer the big question, and then we'll dive into a couple of myths. Where do creativity, where, does, where do creative ideas come from? Where does creativity come from? If you, if you go to the next slide, you'll see three circles. There's four factors that influence creativity. And I know everybody here is probably really smart. I said four, and there's three circles. <laughs> slide, right? Don't worry, we'll get to that. So there's, there's, there's four factors that influence creativity. And this comes from the research by a woman named Teresa Mabule, who's an absolutely genius researcher, started out as an educational psychologist and now teaches at the Harvard Business Review, teaches the next generation of business leaders how to be creative. 
hopefully she doesn't teach any of the accountants, but other than that, she teaches the next generation of business leaders how to be creative. And what she found is four factors. What you have to have is motivation, creative thinking skills, um, expertise, and then a fourth factor I'll talk about in a second. And I think these are really interesting because all of them are, there's sort of an inverted U to them. So expertise is a really great factor, but as we'll find in a little bit, too much expertise can be a bad thing. But you, you do have to know something about the domain that you want a creative idea in. If, if you're trying to come up with the next great idea for how to build a bridge, I hope you understand physics, right? So you have to have some level, a level of expertise. You also have to have creative thinking skills. Now what I mean by skills and what she means by skills you have to know when it's time to brainstorm versus time to do research, when it's time to collaborate versus be individual. Not necessarily this, this thing that you're born with, we'll get into that in a second, but the idea is that you have some practice in different techniques from, like I said earlier, brainstorming methods to a variety of different methods and you know when to use which one. And then motivation I think is an interesting one. Uh, everybody always says necessity is the mother of invention. Necessity is the, I think is the mother of innovation because when you really, really need to solve a problem, you're highly motivated to solve it, and you're more likely to do it. Intrinsic motivation tends to work better than external motivators like uh, rewards and, and bonuses and those sort of things. So it's possible to get those two aligned, which is really kind of cool. And we'll talk a bit about that. Now, the fourth factor, the, the hidden one, is I like to think of it as the blue field that's in the rest of this slide, right? Because it permeates all of the different circles, and it's the social environment. If you have expertise and motivation and you have some experience in the creative process, but you're not in a social environment that supports things like limited risk-taking, that supports sharing of information, that allows people to actually think outside the box instead of say think outside the box and then judge their ideas and shoot them down, then you're more likely to exercise your creativity more often. That social environment really, really shapes whether or not we, uh, even if we have a great idea, if we have it in the wrong social environment, we learn pretty quickly that it's not welcoming to our ideas. We stop expressing them. And then we fall out of practice. And what I think is interesting is that as we fall out of practice, we start to use the very terminology we'll talk about through the rest of this session to disqualify ourselves as creative. And really, I think all of that starts in that social environment. So that was um, Teresa Mobile's four component model. I, I want to sort of break before we dig into the different myths and see if there are any questions on that. So do we have a question from the panel? If, if not right now, I certainly have plenty of questions because I happen to be familiar with her work. And so one of the things that, that I find with her, with her work is, is it's not so much explicitly stated, but I think I guess it's implicit, is that not only do you have to be in an environment for that, but you also have to have the leadership, and we all know the leadership has to be uh, enlightened enough to be able to do that. Isn't that true? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think, you know, fundamentally leaders have uh, the, the biggest lever that I think of influence that a leader can pull is shaping that culture and mm -hmm. shaping that environment. Right. And so it, it's sort of like a double importance on leadership. You have to have leadership that supports the idea, but then also that is careful and specific about cultivating an environment that allows the social environment to happen. Right. And that's, and that's yeah. not easy. That's not easy to have leadership that's enlightened like that, that's willing to do that, because I think in many ways that's very challenging to the leader. Yeah, I agree. Especially, and this is how I found myself needing to write a book about creativity, especially if those leaders are buying into these myths of how it happens instead of uh, following kind of what the research says on how to shape the environment for creativity. So. Oh. Okay, well, let me see if anyone ha has any questions yet. It doesn't, it doesn't look like it quite yet, but I think they're s sort of beginning to absorb what it is you're talking about. So go right ahead. Sure, for sure. And I'm sure we, we got to let, you know, it's still early. We got to let the coffee set in <laughs> myself. We, we uh, you know, it takes, what does it take, 25 minutes or so? So if you just sat down <laughs> with a cup of coffee in about another 15 minutes, that'll kick in and we'll have tons of questions. Right, exactly. <laughs> So um, moving into the next one, and then you can go to the next slide, what I call the, the Eureka myth. Um, and this is one of the most interesting ones because this comes from when you talk to a, almost a, everybody I ran into except people who have to be consistently prolific or what one of my friends, Todd Henry, calls prolific, healthy, and brilliant, right? So they have to consistently come up with great ideas. A lot of people, I think, subscribe to this Eureka myth, and it, it's quite simply the idea that w when you say things like, the, the idea just came to me. You're subscribing to the Eureka myth, right? Or if I ask, this is always an interesting question, if I ask, where do you get your best ideas? M Melanie, where do you get your best ideas? 
Uh, you know, probably when I'm watching TV or something or trying to relax a little bit or when I'm not mm. particularly thinking about the topic. Right, right. <laughs> and, and everybody sort of says that and it creates this feeling that like, oh, the idea just came to me when I wasn't looking for it. The, the most common reaction I ever get is people will say, oh, I get my best ideas in the shower. It's, it's the only time in a work <laughs> setting that it's okay to talk about bathing. Right? <laughs> every, every other time you mention showering, off limits, PMI. Right. For some reason, when it comes to ideas, we're okay with that. And I think that goes back to where your, the phrase Eureka got popularized, the story of Archimedes in the bathtub, right? Or uh, my favorite sort of Eureka story is the story of Isaac Newton in the apple tree, right? We, and we all know this story from childhood, right? Isaac Newton is sitting under an apple tree, and the apple hits him on the head, and he discovers gravity, <laughs> even though, you know, we built the pyramids before that. So I'm sure we knew something about gravity before right. Newton. Um, and, and I actually, I really wanted this story to be true, and it wasn't. I, I researched and researched and researched, and the closest thing I could find to, like, an original source on the story of Newton and the apple was a diary entry by one of Newton's apprentices, William Stuckley. And Stuckley wrote about a dinner that they had, and when they were, after the dinner, they were sitting out in the garden, and Newton was pointing to an apple that was already on the ground and talking about how he was working on a theory that the same force that compels the apple to the ground might explain what keeps planetary bodies or planetary apples, if you will, in motion. That, that was what he was working on. But there's no sort of hit in the head with an apple um, type of moment. And, and in fact, I think that's a, that the, the real version of it is actually a better uh, story to tell because it's a better reflection of how it happened. Right? I mean, if, if you think about the story of Newton and the apple, the apple's actually the, the hero of the story. Right? The apple's doing all the work, right? <laughs> Newton's just sitting there under the tree waiting to get pegged in the head by a piece of fruit. Right. And when, and when we tell that story, that's the lesson that we tell people. Well, <clears throat> maybe not, right? So I, but we all connect with that story. And I, I wanted to really dig into why is this happened? Why, like what you said, why when you're sitting there and you're not really thinking about the problem, does it appear that it just comes to you? And what I found was um, some amazing work by uh, a researcher named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. It's a, it's a really fun name to say, um, especially in talks, because I have to like, really be careful to, to pronounce it properly. Right. But he, he, did, he worked on a, one of the original models of creativity. And I, I have it in the next slide you can see. Um, he has a five-factor model. What he did was he surveyed, he asked uh, almost 200 of the most prolifically creative and renowned creative people in the country to answer questions about um, cre their creative process. And what I think is probably pretty telling, actually, is that only around 75 actually responded. That should tell us something about kind of the need for focus when you're doing great work. But of those 75 that responded, all of their responses, whether it was architects or musicians, everybody responded with essentially the same kind of five factors um, or five stages in their creative process. So they would research. Right? They would then incubate and get insight, and then they would judge the insight and then elaborate it, put it out there into the world. And I, what I think is really interesting is it's stage two and three, the incubation and the insight, because this is something that I think so often, especially in a professional setting, we don't take the time to do. We just try and sort of push through and solve the problem. And we glorify when you're having late hours focused in on, on, uh, on working to solve a problem, when in reality what, what – what Csikszentmihalyi found that the most brilliant people do is they do their research and then they step back from the problem, just like what you were describing. They step back from the problem and they allow their kind of subconscious to take over. And what I think is interesting is we don't actually know what's going on brain-wise, neurons-wise, et cetera. There's about four different theories of what's happening during this incubation period. But we do know that if you step back from the work and then you return to it, you're either really likely to have something kind of snap and connect in your subconscious and get, it can feel like Newton and the apple, it can feel like Archimedes in the bathtub, it can feel like that idea just came to you from somewhere. Even if that doesn't happen though, when you return to work after a period of incubation, the research supports that you'll have more ideas and you'll have better ideas. Which I think is really, really interesting because while we can't normally, I mean, nobody can go in the middle of a work day when they're trying to solve a problem, just go take a bath, right, or go take a shower. That's not really frowned upon. We can't, maybe we can go take a walk if it's kind of lunch hour. But what I think is really interesting is that in, in Csikszentmihalyi's research and in further research on incubation, we found that it, it doesn't matter what you're working on as long as you're not working on that task. So we, they would have people who, were, who would just rest and go take a walk, and they would have other people who just switched and did a different exercise. 
the results were about the same. So what I do in my life, actually, at, at this point when I, when I started kind of trying to practice what I preach, is I started using email very selectively. So I don't, I don't know if you've noticed in the past few months we've been um, interacting back and forth, Melody, but I only respond to emails kind of not at certain times of the day, but I don't, I'm not all that immediate to respond. And the reason for that is I don't have any notifications on my phone. My, when someone sends me an email, it doesn't magically show up on my phone or my computer or my watch. Right? I don't get bugged by any of that sort of stuff. I only get emails when I go sort of to the well to see how many people have sent me an email in the past couple of hours. Because what I'm doing is I'm working on a, an article that I'm writing or prepping for a presentation, and when I need to incubate, then I go to my inbox. Because and let's face it, most emails don't take a lot of higher level thinking to respond to. They just require a little response. So I actually use my email as my incubation. Now that's me, that's, that doesn't have to be everybody, but I think the lesson of New, the real lesson of Newton and the Apple or the real lesson of Eureka, the real lesson of Chick Sent Me High Stages, is how, what is the work that you can be doing that doesn't require high-level thinking but still needs to get done, and how can you put that in your workday in a place where you can actually incubate on those tougher problems? You know, that, For a lot of people, that's different things. You know, that's really interesting because what I was thinking was, it's a good thing you told me that. I was wondering why you didn't respond instantly when I sent you an email, <laughs> so now I understand. But the other, the other thing that I think is fascinating about what you're talking about is the fact that this is why sometimes problems never get completely resolved, right? So when we talk about we have a problem in our organization, we look for very quick responses. And what happens is we do, we do them so quickly, we don't have time for it to incubate, right? And really think right. it over and then move to, move to really a solid solution. And I yeah. think that happens no, more and more. You know, there's a there's a tendency to, you know, if, if, we, if we could do something in one day that would require two, let's just shrink it all down and let's do one day. I mean, I, I remember even teaching sometimes. I would, when I first started teaching, I actually started in, in the working adult programs and the executive MBA programs, and they would always want to, like, skip breaks, just drive right through so they could leave early, right? Right. right. And the research doesn't support that, right? Like, if, if, I had to, if I have to work with a team, if I'm consulting with a, a group and we have – eight hours to work, I would much rather work for four hours in the afternoon of day one than incubate at night and return to the problem in the morning mm -hmm. of day two than try and cram it all into day one or day two right. because it's not going to be enough time to sort of incubate. Right, exactly. Well, I'm going to let you continue on because I know there's, there's, I don't want to give a spoiler alert, but I know there's many, many more myths. So I'll let you continue. If I see questions from our audience, I'll turn to them. Well, perfect. Well, if, so if we move into the next one, this is one of the ones that I think baffles a lot of people, what I call the expert myth. The expert myth is really interesting because we remember from the circles that expertise is important. We need to know something about our domain. But a lot of times our expertise can actually hinder our ability to come up with new and better ideas. There's a, there's a joke in the world of physics. If you're a physics researcher and you don't do Nobel Prize winning work by the time you're 30, you should retire, which is, which is really mean because 30 is like the new... 12, right, at this point. <laughs> right. So, but it, it actually kind of lines up with when you, when you look at all of the ages that people were when they published work that would later go on to win the Nobel Prize in physics, it, it's around 29 to 31. It's somewhere in that range, right? Mm -hmm. We think about I, Isaac Newton was really actually pretty young when he won the prize. He was 46. He won it for work that he published when he was 26. And, and it's a really interesting um, idea that as you move forward, we think that as we move forward and we get more and more expertise, we're going to be better at solving problems. We're going to be better at tying into our creativity. And, and indeed, we kind of have a system where if you can't solve the problem, you pass it up to somebody who's been around longer and see what they can do. But it turns out that doesn't work all the time. We, we think that it's a straight correlation, but as, as we sort of see in the next slide, as, as expertise goes up, a lot of times creative output can go down. In mm -hmm. the best case scenario, it's an inverted U. It's a, uh, it goes up for a little while, then it plateaus for a long time, and then it begins to go back down. In the worst case scenario, the more expertise you have, the, the worse output you have. And I really, this sort of baffled me. Um, and as I, as I get older and more experienced and my salary goes up, I don't like the idea that it's going up unnecessarily, right? Because my expertise is affecting my creative output. But luckily there are ways to sort of solve this. What we, what we think is happening is that if you think about creative output, you think about coming up with great ideas and putting them out into the world, there's two steps. The first is the ideation rate, what we call ideation rate. 
which is how many ideas you're coming up with all the time. And then there's the elaboration rate, which is how many ideas you're actually testing, putting out in the world. And both of those, you need both of those to have creative output, but what's interesting is that as you age and as you gain more expertise, your ideation rate continues to go up. It's the elaboration rate, the number of ideas that you actually act on, that goes down. And that's what's actually suppressing this. And so what, what that basically implies is happening, I think really resonates with a lot of people, resonates with the 35-year-old physicist. As you think of an idea, you have a lot of expertise now to judge the idea before you test it. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you usually save time because you, you go, no, that, that'll never work because it's too similar to this thing and this thing didn't work. And most of the time you're right, right? Let's say nine times out of ten when you come up with a great idea and you reject it, you were probably right to do that. Your expertise is helping you. Every once in a while, right, your expertise might actually be preventing you from testing a, a, a really good idea. So I like to tell the story often, and my wife is a physician, and as I was writing the book, I wish she would have read the book while I was writing it. She waited until after I wrote the book to tell me this story about the discovery of H. pylori, which is a bacteria that causes stomach ulcers. For the longest time in medicine, we thought that stress and acidity levels cause stomach ulcers. Some people still think that, right? Mm -hmm. And then two researchers in Australia got the idea that, well, maybe it's caused by this this specific bacteria called H. pylori. And they, they presented their ideas, and all of the medical experts of the day just said, that's crazy, we know what happens, you shouldn't even bother to test that, we won't even let you do research on that because it's a terrible idea. And they were doing what a lot of experts do, which is they were trying to save time to actually work on the ideas that they thought were great, but what turned, turned out to happen is they were using their expertise to reject an idea that really needed to be tested. So one of the researchers from Australia decided to test it on himself. He actually got a vial of the H. pylori bacteria and swallowed it, <laughs> then stuck a camera down his throat once a day for seven days as an ulcer developed and took pictures of it. Then he took an, anti an antibiotic, swallowed that, kept taking photos of his stomach as the ulcer went away because the bacteria was dead. It was the only way he could get people to pay attention to his idea because so many of the experts were, were saying, like, well, wait a minute. This will never work. In reality, sometimes you need to test out those ideas, especially when, and this we'll see in the next slide, especially when those ideas are coming from a different domain. So the most, what I find is the people that don't succumb to the expertise myth, the people like our Australian friend with the stomach ulcer or uh, the, the Nobel Prize winning 30-year-old, is that they tend to be what we call T-shaped, meaning their expertise mm -hmm. is in one domain, but they've kept a broad horizontal of other um, expertise, like surface level expertise in a bunch of different domains. And what happens, most of the insights that change the world happen when somebody takes something from the horizontal that they only know a little bit about and brings it into their domain or vice versa, when they take something from their big domain and move it forward. When you look at all of the people that have sort of fought the trend, the inverted U of expertise, almost all of them have that T-shaped dimension to them. Which I think it's really interesting because the world doesn't reward that. If you think to all of those medical experts, in medicine, you get more and more specific on a narrower and narrower field. That's not being T-shaped. That's a capital letter I. Right. But in reality, what we need is deep end wide. Right. Well, you know, the interesting thing is you're talking, it makes me think a lot about design thinking. Because yeah. when we continue to have experts, try, the experts in an area continuing to solve every problem, we never really get to any new solutions. It's not until we begin to bring other people in that we really begin to get a sense of how can we solve the problem in a different way. So we also I have agree. a question. We also have a question from the panel, David. So let's yeah. turn over to our panel. Okay, go ahead. David, a uh, question uh, on the, you know, this this uh, reduction in elaboration and output, if you will. I'm wondering how much of it's also due to organizational environment and some of the influences from organizations. I, you know, I, I think of. Uh, young employees when they come into an organization where they have a lot of ideas and a lot of enthusiasm and so forth, but if the organization constrains uh, their, their ability to elaborate on those types of ideas or even act on those ideas, you know, although their expertise continues to grow over the years, uh, I can see where their output, if you will, can decline. Oh, yeah. Uh, you're, so you're going to love my big finish, by the way, because this... I, <laughs> <laughs> this, I, I totally agree with you, and it, it, it happens very often. It, it's what I call the mousetrap myth that I usually sort of end with. Mm -hmm. is this idea that we think 
not only do we think our expertise will increase our creativity, we think that our expertise makes us better at judging creative ideas, and the research doesn't really support that on a couple of different levels. So uh, there's that phrase, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Total rubbish. The world doesn't actually do that. If you build a better mousetrap, most of the time they don't even recognize it. Right? And as the person, like you said, as the person in the organization, the first couple times you're willing to put up with that, eventually you just learn the lesson that the organization doesn't tolerate that. It's easier just to be quiet and, and sort of just be a, a good little automaton, if you will. So <laughs> totally, you're, you're going to love my big finish. So. Okay. Uh, so, David, we've got one more question from our panel. Yeah. Hi, David. Actually, I have a comment. It, it okay. seemed like the stages of research, incubation, and insight kind of line up with the human path, research being childhood, adolescence being incubation, insight being in your professional career, and eventually you have enough to stand on that you just make a stand and a, take a statement. No, I, I think that's actually a really, interesting, um, a really interesting insight, and I think it jives with the idea of the expertise myth too, right? Because I, so I have, a, I have a three-year-old boy and a one-year-old boy, and my three-year-old is the most creative person I know because he doesn't know stuff yet. He's just <laughs> always experimenting, and he comes up with lots of different ideas. And, and it's weird because it's my role, right, as, his sort of, as the person who's guiding him in this early stage path to, like, encourage the, the crazy ideas that he's having but also explain to him that, like, no, B doesn't also make the cuss sound. Like, that's not real. That doesn't... You just came up with that, right? So I have to, I have to teach him stuff, but at the same time, I have to teach him that that coming up with lots of ideas thing, we don't want to go away. We just want to kind of guide it, right? So I think you're, you're definitely right. The, the risk that happens too often, I think, is that we learn as we present all of these ideas in the world that, that like, we, we accidentally send the message that everything that can be figured out has already been figured out, and, and thus we don't necessarily kind of need your original thinking on it. If you think about, like, I don't, want to, I don't want to point the fingers at schools because I think everybody does this to children, but you think about um, the, the path to school, it starts out very sort of fun and exploratory, and eventually the way to get ahead in school, even in through college, is to just remember stuff that was told to you mm -hmm. best instead of coming up with stuff best. And then you, uh, for those of you, if anybody's ever, uh, once you get done with kind of university and you try and go into a master's program or a PhD program, they try and like reteach you how to be inquisitive again because for 12 to 20 years, you've just learned how to regurgitate things. So definitely right. I think you're, you're right on there. I've, I've never made the observation of the five stages, the stages of life, but that's pretty cool. Now I've got, you, you, just, you just ruined my afternoon. I'm going to be thinking about that all after. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't look at it that way, David. Think about it as like a new creative way of thinking and learning. Oh, oh, no, totally, totally. I just, I just mean, like, you know, I had, I had stuff I needed to get done, and now I'm going to play around with that idea all day. But that's fine. That'll be great. So, okay. Summer, that's what academics do during the summer anyway, play around with ideas. Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine. I only I can imagine. So um, we'll go ahead, and then when we have more questions, we'll just turn to the panel. Okay. All right. So let me, let me move into one of my other kind of favorite myths for um, organizations, which is this sort of lone creator myth. I, I think there's a really interesting, and I, I'm, in my next book, I'm actually writing about this. There's an interesting kind of, um, it's too easy to attribute performance to just one person. And when it comes to creativity and innovation, it's, it's not, it's the same. We tend to think that there's sort of, like when we think about Apple, right, Apple computers, who started Apple? Oh, Steve Jobs. Well, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, and then later Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive, right? There was always a sort of collaboration. We never really remember that. Or we think about, like, M Melanie, I'll put you on the spot. Who invented the light bulb? Edison? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, on, no on multiple levels, though, so it's totally okay. So Edison was probably the 23rd or the 22nd person, depending on how you count, to have invented a light bulb. He did invite, invent the best one, right, the only one that was commercially viable kind of at the time. But what I think is most wrong is that the light bulb came out of what I think was Edison's greatest invention, the place called Menlo Park. And in mm, Menlo right, Park, right. Edison uh, funded basically a workshop that's for right. him and 14 to 15 other people that all collaborated on, on various different projects. And, and so, yeah, okay, Edison gets the credit for it. You're, you're, right, you're right on there. 
But there were a bunch of other people that helped that we tend to ignore. In fact, I like to tell people that the sign that you really made it in the world is when the world forgets everybody that helped you get there. Okay? <laughs> so the, the sign that Edison made it is that everybody forgot about the muckers. Right. 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 Muckers was their real term for themselves, by the way, because they were always mucking about in each other's inventions and playing around, which I think is a great term. It, it almost it sounds kind of like a dirty word, even though. It's <laughs> 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 and I, I think this is a really interesting dynamic that, that creativity comes out of collaboration most often, but it begs a very interesting question. So w how do we structure those kind of teams? Because I mean, mm -hmm. when I when I was in school. And even now, when I go to sort of um, different continuing ed workshops, I think everybody really likes to talk about the Tuckman model of group development. If you don't know that, you probably know the phases, storming, norming, performing, adjourning, that sort of thing. And we think about, we think about a team as having to go through some initial stuff in the beginning, and then when they gel, they just perform well forever. And it turns out that's not actually the case. The, the most creative teams are actually relatively short. In some cases, they barely get to performing before they sort of adjourn. Right? And, and the research for this comes out of a really interesting place, not, uh, not the halls of Menlo Park, not the, not the uh, modern office, not, not the uh, offices of Apple Computer, but actually from the Broadway stage. You go to the next slide, I have, I have a picture of what, what I would call the senior leadership team of a Broadway show. So every Broadway show throughout history has about six people on it. I actually have to look because I can never remember all of these names. Composer, a librettist, lyricist, choreographer, director, and producer. I can't remember all, of, all six of those. You don't need to either. The thing that you need to know is that there's six, usually. And, and two researchers, Brian Uzi and Jared Spiro, I were sort of wanting to figure out what's the best combination of those six people. Do, do the best teams actually storm, norm, perform, and then keep working on different projects together in eternity? Are the best teams the tried and true that just keep going? Or are the best teams people that formed for just one time and then move forward. And so what, what Uzi and Spiro did was they studied the entire sort of network of Broadway every year, and they gave every little um, group of six, um, they, they would range from people who were brand new together to people who had, always, who had worked together on a previous project, right? So you think about like brand new is we came together to do uh, the, we, nobody met each other, and we came together to do the show Cats, right? And then on the opposite side of that, you have tried and true, we're making Cats 2, which I hope no one ever makes Cats 2, by the way. <laughs> Do it. Um, but there are people who have always worked together. So if you look on the next slide, you can see sort of a range. The, the, um, the six that are in all black, we'll call that a one. And the ones that are all red nodes, we'll call that a five. They gave a number to every year in Broadway based on how many new versus old teams that there were and the diversity of that team of different new connections versus old connections. And what they found was something really peculiar, right? So I like that when I'm, when I'm presenting in, 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 um, in conferences and things, I like to actually quiz people on what do you think? Do you think people were more successful when they were a one, so a bunch of brand new connections and, and diversity of ideas and all that, or do you think it was a five? And everybody, like one or maybe 10% of the audience will go for one, 10% of the audience will go for five, 80% thinks it's a trick question and they pick which number. What do you think, Melanie? Three. You're wrong. Oh, of course. It's, well, get, follow me. <laughs> Two point six. Close point enough. Six. I was close. Yeah, that's how, well. That's how you know it was an academic, right? Because only two <laughs> academics come up with two point six right. on a scale of one to five. Right. Right. <laughs> Two point six is actually really interesting. If if you think about old and new. 2.6 means that 2.6 people are new connections and, and 3.4 old, right? So just enough old people to keep the systems and processes and the norms that came out of the whole storming, norming thing in place, but just enough new people to come up with new ideas and be sort of supported, right? But it, it begs a really interesting question that I, that I actually asked Brian uh, Uzi when I was writing the book. I called him up and I said, here's what I don't get. How do you have 0.6 of a person? And he just kind of like, I couldn't, we were on the phone, I couldn't see it, but I could tell he was just shaking his head. He just told me, you, you read the study wrong. I said, what do you mean? He said, remember that we didn't study each team. We gave each year of Broadway shows a number based on the overall network, right? meaning how many of these teams were old versus new. He said, and that's the real insight, is that it's not about building a perfect 2.6 old and new connections team to solve a problem. Because the longer a 2.6 team works together, the more they become a five. The, the, as, you know, as soon as they're at 2.6, it doesn't stay there. 
once they get more familiar with each other, they become an old connection team, a team of old colleagues instead of a mix of old colleagues and newbies. And I think the implication for organizations is not to build perfect 2.6 teams, but to always be building new teams. Right. And to always have a system that when you have a new project, you don't go back to the same five people that respond to the same manager. You build a team based on what that project needs. You let that team perform, and then you let it disband. Just like a Broadway show, we'll come together. They'll, they'll write the script. They'll write the songs. They'll, they'll hire the cast. They'll rehearse. They'll perform for a few weeks, and then they'll disband. And keeping that network at a constant 2.6 level is what really allows the perfect kind of team to form. I think the implication of the lone creator myth isn't just that, that creativity is a team sport, but it's that the best teams are temporary. They're, they're kind of not permanent. Well, and, you know, I'm just going to add something here because this is what I love so much about academics and what I don't see enough of in organizations. In organizations, I see a lot of always gathering the same people, what, no, almost no matter what the problem is. And, but in academics, I know in my case, I would rather work with someone I've never worked with before so that I can get some new ideas. And I'd rather, you know, do a project with them, try to write a paper with them, or be on a panel with them, because I don't know what they're bringing to the table, and I want to hear their ideas, versus somebody who I've worked with over and over again, I sort of already know what they're bringing, what they bring to the party. And so yeah. it, gives, it gives a lot more, as you're saying, a lot more creativity to the effort. Yeah, no, totally agree. So, so academics, and there, there are a few organizations that do it. Uh, the consulting firms are actually pretty great at this. If you think about your big McKinsey's and Boston Consulting Groups, et cetera, they will, um, they'll do what I call write the org chart in pencil. So based on the needs of a client, they'll assemble a team that'll work together with that client. They go for fairly long, right? So three months, six months, sometimes 18 months, depending on what the client needs, but sometimes shorter. The others that, that I think do this the, really the best are your industrial design firms, your design thinking people, because mm -hmm. the nature of the work is project-centered. I think really what, what blocks a lot of organizations is the actual organizational chart, right? right? So if you think back to the organizational chart was invented by the railroad industry, right, which is sort of the ultimate things are never going to change industry, right, because you laid the track. You can't exactly move it around based on the needs of projects, right? Mm -hmm. And so the org chart was based on the idea of a rigid, inflexible system. But most people in kind of a knowledge work world, we don't, we don't work in that system anymore. The, the unit of work isn't people or a railroad line anymore. It's a project. So I think we need to go back to thinking about how do we structure teams based on projects instead of based on this kind of rigid org chart. Right, right. I, I really, I couldn't agree with you more because what we don't do is tap into the people at all different levels in the organization because oftentimes the people you don't ask are the people who might have the greatest ideas. Yeah, So I, I totally agree. Okay, well, you know, continue on. I'm still kind of checking to see what questions we may have from our panel. So, um, oh, well, don't continue on quite yet. We have one, one question before you get started right. on the next myth. Uh, on the line of creativity, uh, one of your articles that you had published was uh, titled Why We Desire But Don't Promote Creative Leaders. And in that, I read a very, very interesting uh, line which uh, seems to play into this line of uh, uh, conversation. Is you, you write in there that we love stories of created pe creative people. We just don't want to be led by them. And I'm curious about that. It sounds like uh, you know some of the organizational dynamics uh, are more aligned with this traditional hierarchical structure, if you will, and maybe that creates the tension between creative people uh, and the rest of the organization. I'm just kind of interested in your comments. Yeah. So I mean, I, I agree with you. That's kind of the fundamental of. And you're making me nervous. You researched me beforehand. <laughs> Um, I mean, if you think back to the organizational chart, right, invented by the railroad, invented by a system that was, was designed, D Daniel McCollum is the name of the guy that sort of drew the first ever org chart, and he drew it for downward flow of information. He wanted to be able to give orders to managers at different spots along these lines that were never going to change. It was, I think it was the Erie, so it was in Pennsylvania Railroad, right, that these, these spots were never going to change, and so he needed people who were kind of good order takers good at downward information and who would report back and flow information up. And so in a, in a system that never changes, that's awesome. 
And I think so often, like, even though we've moved to a knowledge work economy where we're project-based, where we need more innovative ideas, et cetera, we still think about the system as that. We need a rigid org chart where information, orders can flow down and reports back can flow up and kind of that's it. And the best people for those roles are your sort of order takers, your, your people who will get in line and get with the program and who won't kind of rattle the cages. And those creative leaders, the ones that we love to talk about in the press, your Steve Jobs of the world, right? Steve, if you talk to a lot of people, I thought this was really interesting. Not a lot of people paid attention to this, but when Tim Cook first took over, everybody, a lot of the people who had worked for Tim Cook before were talking about how, oh, he's really nice and he's great and he's responsible and he's not kind of frustrating the way Steve was, right? But Steve got a lot of stuff done, right? So you talk to the people who worked for him, he's probably a pretty, not a fun guy to work for, not a fun guy to work with me, he got kicked out of his own company. I mean, that's the ultimate, like... <laughs> We desire to tell the story about them. We just don't necessarily want to work with them because we've got this hierarchical system that people need to get with the program, right? So, yeah, you're, you're spot on on that. I think this, this comes with a lot of it. So, in, my, in actually, in my um, the book that I've been working on all year this year, I'm really looking at what are the implications of the organizational chart for how we do this. If the world of work changed, how do we need to restructure organizations to kind of get in line with that? And that's that's kind of one of the points is that, in a very systems approach, sometimes people who don't fit in with the system are the people we need, but the people who aren't comfortable there. Well, we're looking forward to that because, because as a uh, public sector employee, this is a hierarchical, bureaucratic environment that we work in, and uh, trying to drive innovation and creativity can be uh, an incredible challenge just because of the structures that are in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I, I can't go into too depth on it or they might cut my feed, but I totally hear you. <laughs> Okay, I don't, I don't think we have any other questions quite yet, so go ahead and just continue on. I know you have a lot of myths to talk about. Yeah, so let me, um, let me touch into, let me move forward, and let me touch into the cohesive myth for a little bit, because I think this is a great follow-up to the lone creator myth, because one of the great things about working alone on a problem is that there's no one to argue with, right? There's, <laughs> there's no friction. And a lot of times, I think, when we look at these outstandingly creative companies, your, your Pixar's, for example, where if you ever get the chance to, to go see the headquarters of Pixar, it's a really fun-looking place, right? There's your standard kind of California, Silicon Valley, San Francisco, or Bay Area kind of fun environment, right? There's ping-pong tables and foosball tables and free food and people running around on scooters. And they actually have, in their campus, they have larger-than-life little statues of all of the different characters, right? I actually, I, I keep on my desk this uh, little from Monsters, Inc., right? As, as a, because there's a life-size, six-foot-tall one at, at Pixar's headquarters. And when you're walking around a place with cartoon characters around you, it can be really easy to think like, oh, the secret to having creative fun, to having creative teamwork is fun, right? And in reality, a company like Pixar will tell you that it's actually, it's actually conflict. It's a, it's a right. lack of cohesion that actually sort of drives us forward. Now, it's not personality-based conflict where people are infighting and arguing and doing all that sort of thing, but it's a task-focused conflict. So right. Pixar does a thing that they call dailies, or some people call them shredding sessions, where essentially every once in a while, usually daily when it comes to crunch time, they'll get together with the director and the animators and other people who are working on a film, and they'll look at the film frame by frame by frame. And Pixar animates at 26 frames per second. So this can take a while. And they will, they will tear apart what's wrong with every frame. So they'll say something like, yeah, I don't, I don't like Mike's eyes in, that, in Monsters University in this scene. He doesn't look fierce enough. Or he, looks, or he should look nice in his eyes but angry somewhere else, right? They'll actually they'll say this to the guy who just made that frame, just animated it a few hours beforehand. They'll tear it apart, which which they know, Ed Catmull, the founder of Pixar, uses this phrase that every Pixar film starts out terrible, and that making a film is the process of going to, from what he calls, suck and non-suck. <laughs> and when it non-sucks, they ship it, and they send off the film. <laughs> and they know that this process, shredding it, doing daily critique sessions, is what takes them from suck to non-suck. But it can be really damaging, right? If you think about, if anybody's ever been on the receiving end of, of constructive criticism, it can kind of hurt, right? right. And the, the worst, I think one of the worst ones is we do this, and I've been, you know, I've been trained in how to deliver the compliment sandwich, right? Which is how we're supposed to deliver criticism. Um, compliment sandwiches taste terrible, right? Because if you, if you have no idea what I'm saying, a compliment sandwich, you, um, you start out with an unrelated positive comment, right? Then you do the actual critique you wanted to say, 
and then you pivot quickly to another totally unrelated positive compliment so that it's easier to take the criticism. Well, turns out that doesn't help all that well with their criticism either. So what, what Pixar has invented, and the research kind of supports that we need this criticism, we need it delivered in a certain way, what, what Pixar has created is what I call um, plussing. And you'll see on the, uh, on the next slide is just a giant plus symbol because it's, uh, I think this is probably one of my key lessons for if you're on a team. And plussing essentially works like this. In a plussing session, you will, uh, when you deliver your critique, instead of compliment sandwich, you'll just deliver your critique, but it's taken from the world of improv, you always have to be building off of it. So in the world of improv, there's this saying that you always have to accept an offer, you always have to, to be giving an offer. So it, when you're delivering your critique, you'll say, I don't like Mike's eyes in this scene from Monsters University, then you have to say, what if we did this? And you have to give them some suggestion on how to improve it. And then when the critique session is over and you leave the room, that person who received the critique reserves the right to accept or, or reject how to solve the problem. But the idea is that it's, it's not saying, it keeps this conflict task focused because it's not saying you're a bad animator and you did this wrong. It's saying, I care so much about this project that I'm going to point out this thing that's broken and also give you my suggestion on how to fix it. You can use it if you want. So instead of leaving the room with just a bunch of criticism on what they did wrong, they leave the room with a bunch of different possible solutions that they could take. And I think that keeps the criticism task-focused enough but also easy to receive enough to where it can actually make headway. The problem with the compliment sandwich, by contrast, is that you end up walking out of that session not knowing if you're going to be fired or going to be promoted because you, you're juggling all of this different stuff. It's easier just to say, here, this is the problem, and here is my suggestion on how to fix it. I care enough to give you both. Well, you know, David, don't you have to be in a pretty trusting sort of environment to be able to do that? Because uh, I, I, you find, I think, in a lot of organizations, not that you, you're criticized all the time, but things begin to become personal. And so, um, you know, if someone says they don't like your work, it's almost a personal attack on you. And then something then unfortunately devolves and then bad feelings start to happen. And so how do you get away from that? How can you kind of get away from that whole idea? So we go back to the social environment that we talked about in the beginning and the importance of leadership in that. But I think what's interesting is a, a company like a Pixar, a company that will do plussing, is very serious about making sure that all of the critiques also come with that suggestion. And when they don't, then instead of me getting offended, if you gave me a critique that, wasn't, that didn't come with a plus, didn't come with a suggestion, instead of me being offended by it, the, the room around it is suddenly shocked by your behavior because your behavior is not actually constructive, right? So there's this sort of reinforcing social proof that it's about the plus. The criticism is just a way to get to the plus. Now, that, that takes a while to build, right? It's really hard to take a group that's used to just complaining right. and turn them into plussing. But you can take sort of small steps in through that. One of my favorite things is I'll train people to say, literally say the phrase, you owe me a plus, right? And if they don't know what plussing is, explain to them what plussing is and say, I'll accept your criticism, but only contingent on you giving me a suggestion for how to solve it. Right. So that's a terrific technique. I mean, I think if you know, uh, hopefully we're taking, we're all taking a lot out of this, but I think if people are going to walk away with one idea, and we haven't heard everything you have to say yet, but if they walk away with one idea, I think that's a terrific idea because that could make meetings so much more productive. Yeah. No, I, I, I really believe in the, we call it the gospel of plussing. I'll give one caveat, though. Um, after I wrote the book, my wife read it and learned about plussing. And that made things really interesting at home because now I can't just gripe about stuff. I have to offer a plus, right? So, so teach it to everybody except your spouse. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's, it works. It works well there too. And that's also great advice that uh, the audience can walk away with. So, okay. I'm just going to check quickly to see if there's any questions. If not, go ahead to the next myth. All right. So let's move into my. I don't want to call it my favorite myth. <laughs> this is the one that I I want to talk about most because most because we, we've already actually sort of talked about it, it's this idea of the mousetrap myth. Move forward in the, the mousetrap myth, like I said earlier, comes from this idea that if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. And it's, like I said earlier, it's kind of rubbish. So the actual mousetrap, if, if you think about a mousetrap, right, what do you, what do you think about? I think I have one of these in my, yeah. I carry this around to speeches. You're thinking about this, right? This was invented in 1899, 1899, right? And every year since then, 
400 patent applications are submitted for presumably better mousetrap, right? What I think is interesting, by the way, 1899 was also the year that Charles Duell presented, he's the head of the U.S. Patent Office, he presented to Congress and said, we should close the patent office, nothing new or worthwhile is going to be invented anymore. right? <laughs> anyway, um, so 1899, 400 applications, 20 of them have been developed into commercially viable products. And, and one time I found myself, this is a really weird conference to be speaking at, but I found myself at the conference for the owners of pest control companies, right, <laughs> talking about the mousetrap myth. And they explained to me what each and every one of the different 20 mousetraps that they use uh, are, right? And they, they also said something better. And if you take away only two things, take away plussing and take away this, they told me that in that traditional mousetrap, peanut butter works better than cheese. So don't put cheese in that and peanut butter works better. So great, good tip. Anyway, um, 1899, 20 better mousetraps. We all think back to that one, that traditional. And it doesn't just happen in the world of mousetraps, right? So we talked about earlier Steve Jobs, right? Steve Jobs' great revelation was the graphical user interface. But Xerox invented that, right? Xerox invented it and didn't see it. Kodak invented the digital camera and decided not to pursue it, let Sony pursue it out from under them, right? Even in the world of, of music and fine arts, one of the most famous pieces in the history of musical composition is Igor Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. And it's famous for two reasons. One, it's, it's an amazing piece. If you've ever seen Fantasia, you've seen it because that was represented in, in, um, in the Rite of Spring. But it also started a riot on the, on the opening night in Paris. Literally, there was a fight over it because some people hated it so much that they, they started arguing with the people that liked it. They caused a riot. Stravinsky had to flee the theater, never got to see the curtain close. Now, now we show the song to our kids in Fantasia, and they don't hit anybody. Well, they don't hit anybody because of the song. Uh, so, so what's going on here? What's, what's, why is this happening? Well, it, it turns out that we think we're really good at judging new ideas. When we say we want out-of-the-box thinking, we think we're gonna be able to recognize that. But for an idea to be out of the box, or to be creative or innovative, it has to be new and it has to be useful at the same time. It has to be original and it has to be seen as practical. And there's a problem with that because if something is original, it, it departs from the status quo, it departs from our past experiences and takes us somewhere new. But what do we use to judge whether or not something is useful and practical? The only thing we have to judge on is our past experience. If we have no data, if we haven't tested it, the only thing we can use when we're judging an idea is past experience. So reconciling those things into an idea that has to simultaneously depart from the status quo and be seen as better than the current status quo is really hard to do. And as a result, a lot of leaders say, oh, we want out-of-the-box thinking, and they don't actually get it. There was a, a follow-up, there was a really interesting study that was done um, really recently, maybe two years ago, and it showed that if you gave a bunch of different product ideas to managers inside of, inside of a company and then to the customers in that company, the managers would systematically reject the ideas that were highest rated by the customer. Mm -hmm. right? So we think we want really great ideas, but, when, but great ideas end up getting rejected because they're not practical, because they don't go with the status quo, they don't fall in line with the hierarchy of the systems that we're talking about. And in a, you know, I, I heard I heard the the B word used earlier in a bureaucracy in a hierarchy. The, the larger sort of the hierarchy, the the more it becomes what I what I like to call a hierarchy of no, because to get an idea greenlighted, it has to go up and up and up and up and up and up and up, and it only takes one no to shoot it back down. Mm -hmm. And this can be really damaging. And and you know what what I think is really interesting, and this is why kind of I like talking about this is sort of it's weird that I like talking about this myth because it's kind of a buzzkill. Because we don't really know how to solve this problem, right? We're, we're at the point where we've just found out with research that this is a systematic problem. This isn't just an issue of having a bad leader or a bad manager. Every human has this bias against great ideas, as I call it. You say that we want new ideas, but we can only judge ideas by our past experience. And so we need like a creativity anonymous, right? Hi, my name is Dave, and I'm terrible at projecting great ideas. X in the circle, right? Because I think that's really key. If you're in a leadership role and someone is presenting to you a, a new idea, one of the things that we think we need to do right off the bat is judge the idea based on, okay, not only do I have the resources to kind of fund this idea, but if I send this up to my manager, my leader, will it get accepted or rejected? And in reality, I think we end up judging ideas far too soon. But what we actually need is, is data. We actually need to figure out how can we test this idea or as 
as um, one of my intellectual heroes, Roger Martin, likes to say, when new ideas are presented to him, he says, what would have to be true in order for this idea to work? Which is not criticizing the idea, but it's actually asking the question, how do I test your idea so that when I present it to the next level, I can present not just the idea, but the early, early feedback, the early data on why your idea will work. Right. Too often, and the most innovative companies figure out, how do we test ideas before we judge them instead of judge them on whether or not we should test them? Right. Well, somehow we got back to design thinking with Roger Martin. So, yeah. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's hard for me to believe that our time is beginning to run down because it's been so it's been so interesting, and I think we learned so much. I'm going to just check with the panel to see if there's any more questions, and and uh, we have we do have time for one more question. So this will be the final question. Okay. Go ahead. David, just a, uh, kind of some curiosity and maybe some recommendation uh, from you with your experience. The, uh, one of the challenges, certainly in the public sector, is uh, that dealing with the tension between creativity and innovation and risk aversion, which mm -hmm. you know, a lot of things that are in place in the public sector contribute to risk adverse cultures. Uh, there's not a lot of value in a lot of uh, federal departments being on the leading edge of anything. We want to wait until something is a proven commodity or whatever before we embrace it. Uh, however, it's this creativity and innovation that really propels organizations forward. So just, uh, you know, your ideas on how best to overcome those kind of things. I know that's a real broad <laughs> question. Yeah, no, 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 I mean, so, so what, the reason they call it the public sector, right, is because everything's public, it's successes <laughs> and failures, right? And so the, the risk is that if we, if we take this and we test it, it's going to sort of turn out failures. And I think this is where, as best we can, the, the public se sector can maybe embrace a beautiful thing that the tech sector did maybe 20 years ago, which was abuse the word beta, Right? Make, it, make it as clear as possible. If you, if you remember, probably uh, almost everybody I know has a Gmail account, Google Mail. Right? Gmail started out as a beta program and literally had millions of users before they were willing to take the word beta off. And the reason was that they wanted it clear to people that like, we're testing this, this is going to have glitches, this is going to be a weird rollout, it's a beta. Now I think you know, that, that longer, you, so, so earlier I had my afternoon ruined, I probably have my weekend ruined now about how do we do this inside the public sector where it's readily kind of available. Um, but I think one is starting with that idea of beta. I also think that one of the things I've been really kind of excited about the recent administration has been using things like innovation grants and what things can we make public to other, to um, for-profit companies, private individuals to kind of experiment and we'll let them do the experimentation and get the results. Right? And then we'll judge the idea and see what kind of the hot commodity is. So I'm really excited by how many different kind of innovation grants and open source, open innovation things that I'm seeing going on right now in the public sector. I hope to see more of that. One of the, one of the organizations that I'm uh, on the board of advisors for is a group called FuseCore. And FuseCore does an amazing work at the city and state level government, putting entrepreneurs in one-year fellowships inside of city and um, state level governments. And maybe we can talk about how to roll out FuseCore on a, on a more federal, on a public level, but I think it's brilliant because the idea is like we're bringing in this person to help us test the idea, to help bring some of those kind of ideas in, the outsiders thing in, the expertise thing in, and they kind of bring with them a little less risk aversion, right? And worst case scenario, like it's, it's a one-year fellowship, right? So there's, the, the, it's not necessarily the, if it doesn't work, if we, if we put all of this money in a one-year fellowship and, or this, uh, this energy into a one-year fellowship and the program doesn't kind of take off, we've only made kind of that one-year initial commitment, that one fellow commitment, and they go back to their work and, and we can go back to ours. But I'll tell you that there have been, um, there have been dozens of FuseCore fellows placed and none of, the time, none of the time of their projects been colossal failures, right? So I think it's encouraging to me that bringing that sort of that mindset, that more entrepreneurial mindset, kind of rubs off on that risk-averse culture. So I think we have two things. I think structurally, I'm excited by things like those innovation grants, and then culture-wise, I'm excited by things like what FuseCore is doing to increase kind of that public-private partnership. The, the key buzzword now, I think, is the tri-sector athlete, right? How do we get somebody that's played in all different public, private, um, uh, non-for-profit, how do we get somebody who's been in all of those and kind of help shape our culture as the best blend of all three? 
So, you know, unfortunately, I, I hate to say this, but we're running out of time. I can't believe how fast that 60 minutes has gone by. So, David, first, I want to thank you for being our guest. I think, I know I certainly learned a lot. I know our audience learned a lot. And so thank you very much for, for being with us today. And uh, for everyone else, please uh, watch us next month for the next HUD OCIO learning session. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.